Last week, we witnessed an incredibly rare occurrence. During the opening quarter of a game against the Cincinnati Bengals, Buffalo Bills safety Damar Hamlin went into cardiac arrest after colliding with wide receiver T. Higgins. Let's talk about what happened, how Hamlin is doing, and what, if anything, could have been done to prevent this incident from occurring. In this clip, we can see Damar Hamlin and White collide with Bengals wide receiver T. Higgins in black. So after taking the hit, we can see Hamlin stand up and adjust his helmet before collapsing onto his back. Initially, it seemed to be some sort of head or neck injury, However, as the Bills head trainer initiated CPR, we realized it was something cardiac in nature. After several minutes of CPR and the use of an automated external defibrillator, or AED, medical personnel on site were able to get pulses back. An ambulance was pulled onto the field, and Hamlin was rushed to nearby University of Cincinnati Medical Center for further care. Upon arrival to the hospital, he was listed in critical condition and was subsequently intubated and sedated for further treatment and evaluation. After a few days on the ventilator and extensive testing, Hamlin's condition improved. He became more responsive and was able to breathe independently, communicate with friends and family, and even get up to walk. It's reported that he even jumped out of bed to celebrate teammate Hines' kickoff return touchdown in the game against the Patriots over the weekend, setting off every alarm in the ICU in the process. As of January 10th, 2023, Hellman's condition continues to improve. He's reportedly working with physical and occupational therapy, walking the unit, tolerating a regular diet, and spending time with family and friends. Although he's already met some key milestones in his recovery, he still has a long road ahead of him before he can consider stepping out on the field again. Now, the question on everyone's mind, what in the world happened? Football players get tackled every day and we don't see them going into cardiac arrest. What made this event so different? The most likely culprit is a condition called commotio cortis, which is Latin for agitation or disruption of the heart. This rare condition is characterized by sudden cardiac arrest after blunt trauma to the chest without any evidence of underlying injury to the sternum, ribs, or heart, and it occurs when an individual takes an impact to the chest during a specific phase of the cardiac cycle. It's believed that the mechanical force of the impact causes a stretch in the heart, which subsequently activates ion channels. If enough ion channels open during a vulnerable period of the cardiac cycle, it can cause the heart to contract abnormally, resulting in ventricular fibrillation, which is one of the two most common rhythms in cardiac arrest. What makes this condition so rare is that there are a few key things that need to occur. To start, the blunt trauma occurs to the anterior chest directly over the heart. Typically, these incidents involve blunt trauma with a small dense object, like a baseball or a hockey puck, as the impact is localized to a smaller region of the chest. That being said, there have been reported cases of commotio cordis during football, soccer, karate, and other contact sports competitions. Next, the trauma has to occur during a specific phase of the cardiac cycle, namely at the beginning of ventricular repolarization. If we look at this diagram of an EKG, we can see the different phases of the cardiac cycle. The P wave is when the top two chambers of the heart contracts, we call this atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is when the bottom of the heart contracts, and that's ventricular depolarization. And the T wave is when the bottom of the heart relaxes. This is ventricular repolarization. The window for commotio cordis is at the upswing of the T wave. That's when the ventricles are just starting to relax. If the blunt force occurs either before or after this really precise moment, it's unlikely to cause cardiac arrest. Now keep in mind, the window for commotio cordis to occur accounts for approximately 1% of the cardiac cycle, which equates to about eight thousandths of a second. That's assuming the cardiac cycle is 0.8 seconds on average, but the window becomes even smaller when you consider the elevated heart rate of an athlete when playing a sport. In short, it's an exceedingly small window of opportunity, which is probably the main reason that we don't see this occurring more often. And lastly, the impact needs to be sufficient to trigger ventricular depolarization, which is estimated to be about 50 joules. And for reference, 50 joules is about as much energy as a baseball thrown at 40 miles an hour, which can actually be achieved by children less than age 10. Risk has been shown to peak around 50 joules because at higher energy levels, you're more likely to experience structural damage to the heart as opposed to isolated electrical disturbances that result in VFib. This is likely why the impact that downed Damar Hamlin didn't seem particularly rough or abnormal. It's not enough trauma to physically damage the heart, it's just enough to cause some electrical issues. Another factor that might have come into play here is that small dense objects like a baseball or a hockey puck are thought to carry more risk because they concentrate the impact over a smaller area. Now with Damar Hamlin, we can see that T Higgins dropped his shoulder in anticipation of the tackle, which may have concentrated the impact more directly over Hamlin's heart. Because all three of these things need to happen for commotio cortis to occur, it's exceedingly rare. 
it's estimated that there are less than 30 cases every year. Another interesting thing is that approximately 95% of people who experience commotio cordis are male, and the majority of cases occur in children and teenagers aged 15 and below. So young males seem to be at the highest risk. Although commotio cordis is the most likely cause for what happened to Damar Hamlin, there are other things on the differential. According to research, the most common causes of cardiac arrest in young athletes is underlying cardiac illness. This can include both structural issues of the heart, like hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCAM, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, and coronary artery anomalies, as well as non-structural issues like long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, and catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Damn, that was a hard sentence. In addition, things like steroid or stimulant use can increase the risk for dangerous arrhythmias. That being said, these issues appear to be less likely in this incident, as there was a clear trauma to the chest immediately before Hamlin went into cardiac arrest, which is more typical of commotio cordis. In addition, an underlying cardiac disease is less likely in an NFL player because they receive extensive cardiac workups before each season, including EKGs and evaluation of family history and stress testing, etc. Regardless, commotio cordis is a clinical diagnosis, meaning there are no specific tests to determine if it has occurred. Instead, it's diagnosed based on a history of blunt trauma to the chest immediately prior to cardiac arrest and a lack of injury or structural abnormality of the heart. Until extensive testing is completed, we can only speculate. In terms of treatment for commotio cordis, it's pretty much just early initiation of CPR and early defibrillation, which is exactly what happened on the field. Another question on everyone's mind is, when will Hamlin be able to return to playing in the NFL? According to the American Heart Association, return to play after commotio cordis is largely dictated by the presence or absence of an underlying cardiac disease. Given the number of factors that need to just line up perfectly for commotio cordis to occur, a second instance in Hamlin is unlikely to happen. That being said, the cautious thing to do would be to avoid sports that involve chest wall impact moving forward. Another factor that must be considered is the psychological impact of an event like this. A near-death experience while while playing a sport can easily affect your ability or willingness to continue playing. Only time will tell how this event will affect Hamlin's career in the NFL. Now, let's talk about if anything could have been done differently. Historically, survival rates for commotio cordis have been low. However, early access to CPR and early defibrillation in recent years seem to have improved outcomes. From what we saw happen last week, the trainees and medical staff on site did everything that they should have. Hamlin received early CPR and defibrillation and received extensive post-care treatment with extensive cardiac work. One thing that I've seen many people bringing up is the use of chest protectors. However, research has shown that many cases of commotio cordis have occurred in individuals who were wearing chest protectors. So in short, this seems to be one of those freak things that happens from time to time. What's important is to continue training and educating medical personnel so that they can quickly identify commotio cordis and initiate early CPR and defibrillation as indicated. Events like these are always jarring because they force us to look at our own mortality. We see something like this happen to a young, successful football player that has a promising career and a life ahead of him, and it just makes us realize how fleeting our lives are, how everything can just be taken away in an instant. I try to view situations like this as a reminder that no matter what is going on in your life, every day is a gift, and we shouldn't take the time that we have for granted. All the best to Damar Hamlin, his family, and everyone else that this event has impacted. I wish him a smooth recovery, and I'm looking forward to seeing him come back from this event. Much love, my friends, and I'll see you guys in that next one.